Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight on this Wednesday, January 2nd. They see child abuse, they see domestic, they see the worst part of Today. What can Chicago do following yet another case of police suicide? Activists call on the Pope to remove Cardinal Blaise Supic from the top position organizing a Vatican conference on sex abuse. More candidates for mayor are removed from the ballot as election officials race to get ready in time for early voting. A New Year's Day triumph for space exploration. We hear from the lead scientist behind the farthest flyby ever. How did free speech protections come about and where are they headed? A new book explores that and more. A new nonprofit puts its back into providing low cost furniture to Chicago's needy. And the weird and fanciful art of the Harry Who, a group of Chicago artists now getting their due. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Phil Ponce. A Chicago alderman is in police custody. Brandis Friedman has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Brandis. Well, and Phil, police have charged 22nd Ward Alderman Ricardo Munoz with misdemeanor domestic battery. Police say they arrested Munoz at his ward office in Little Village this morning. They say he's being charged in connection with an incident that occurred on New Year's Eve. Munoz's wife told police that the two had an argument and Munoz allegedly pushed and hit her. His bond hearing is scheduled for tomorrow morning in domestic violence court. Until then, he remains in police custody at the 10th Police District in North Lawndale. Over the summer, Munoz announced his plans to retire from City Council at the end of this term after 25 years in office. The police union has lost yet another round in its fight to influence the consent decree that could be steering Chicago police reform. A federal appeals court today upheld a ruling that barred the Fraternal Order of Police from joining a lawsuit between the city and the Illinois Attorney General. In a 17-page ruling, the court wrote that the union knew the consent decree might affect its interests, but waited almost a year before filing its own motion to intervene. In a statement, Attorney General Lisa Madigan says she's pleased with the ruling and that, quote, we were careful to engage all of the interested stakeholders who are concerned about reforming the Chicago Police Department, which is why we were in regular communication with the leadership of the Fraternal Order of Police and their lawyers as we negotiated the consent decree. The FOP responded that it's disappointed with the decision, believing that this consent decree is illegal. President Kevin Graham said in a statement that his leadership will meet with its board of directors to discuss legal options, including taking the case to the U.S. Supreme Court. Mayoral hopeful Paul Vallis is making affordable housing a campaign issue, pledging to overhaul building and zoning codes to create new affordable housing units. No matter how much money we spend in incentivizing developers to uh, to make uh, to provide affordable housing units as part of their developments it's never going to address the needs of the city in fact it's it will barely address a fraction of the city's needs 50,000 Vallis toured an apartment building where owners have established garden units to be used as affordable housing or housing for people with disabilities he says his plan would make it easier for landlords to convert unfinished or unproductive spaces into apartments and believes there could be as many as 175,000 units available once converted he's calling on other candidates to back an ordinance to that end already in city council as for the weather, tonight cloudy, then clearing with a low around 23 degrees. Then tomorrow, sunny with a high near 36. And don't forget, you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com news. You can also watch via podcast in the PBS video app. Now, Phil, back to you. Thank you, Brandis. A sobering start to the new year for the Chicago Police Department, which saw one of its members take his life. This is the fifth suicide by a Chicago Police Department officer in the past six months. Chicago Tonight's Amanda Vinicky is here with more. 
Amanda. Well, Phil, the police department does confirm that 36 year old officer Dane Anthony Smith killed himself yesterday. And as you noted, this is part of an alarming trend, particularly in the city of Chicago, with five CPD officers committing suicide in the last calendar year. The Department of Justice report compiled after the fallout of the Laquan McDonald shooting found the rate of suicide in the CPD is 60% higher than other police departments. The head of the Chicago chapter of the National Alliance on Mental Illness says there is a mental health crisis, period, with long waiting lists for those seeking treatment, a fear of even getting treatment, and so on. But she says that's amplified for 911 dispatchers, firefighters, and other first responders, Chicago police in particular. Morale is really low. I think that Chicago has a lot of challenges, and we are asking our first responders to respond to all of them. They are our safety net. Our city employees are our safety net, and we are asking them to be responsible for everything. We are asking them, in particular, to be responsible for everyone else's mental health crisis. And here they are, probably suffering themselves and in crisis themselves, and we're just gutting them day after day after day. So what is the department doing about it? Well, certainly this is tragic for the department and particularly those who are close to Officer Smith. Superintendent Eddie Johnson did send a letter to everyone on the police force recognizing officers have a tough job and emphasizing they need to lean on one another. The CPD previously put out a video to send the message to officers that you are not alone. You're always at work. I can't, I can't do this by myself anymore. You know what? I think we need time. I need my space. I just need time away from you. I can't do this. Officer, I need you to come see me in my office. It's a civil lawsuit, sir. Hey, pig. Pigs in the blanket! Crying like pigs! Some believe the chant refers to putting police officers in body bags. So that video expressing some of the hardship that officers go through and ends with areas where officers can get help. In addition to that, the CPD says it has doubled the number of counselors who are part of its employee assistance program. That's where police can see a psychiatrist, as can members of their family or retired officers. And the CPD says it is in the process of hiring additional counselors. Also, it's expanding its peer-to-peer -peer network so that officers who've been through trauma and may be contemplating suicide side can speak with officers who've been through something similar. Also, there are now chaplains for every major religious domination. Still, there are calls for more to be done. Mayoral candidate Lori Lightfoot, who had been head of the police board, says supervisors need to be better trained to spot red flags like drug or alcohol abuse or whether an officer is having problems at home. She says they need to be held accountable for that. We have done a woefully terrible job in providing support to officers. We've got to demystify the concern that a lot of officers have that if they seek counseling that they're going to lose their uh, FOID card um, and therefore they're not going to be able to um, be on the job. A spokesman for the Fraternal Order of Police said that he was reticent to comment on this most recent suicide, given that there's no way to know why anyone would take such a drastic and tragic action. But he went on to say that the FOP will redouble its efforts to work with the CPD and with the city to get help for any officer who's struggling with depression. Also in a statement, he went on to indicate what the union perceives to be a contributing factor, writing, the fact that the police are so vilified in the media and the political system constantly subject to false accusations that lead to discipline and other forms of harassment certainly takes its toll on police officers and is a leading cause of despair and low morale. Now, for her part, the head of NAMI Chicago says it's impossible to separate an officer's home life from his or her professional life. She says there are no simple answers. Commanders can require officers who've been through a traumatic event to see a counselor, but trauma's cumulative, stresses build. And there's also no set definition for what could be a trigger. It's not necessarily a shooting. It could be that a call touches on an officer's personal past. She says what is crucial is to remove the stigma and asking for help. 
And we have to think about um, the stages in which you reform a department that is very uncomfortable seeking mental health services generally. There is a lot of machismo. There is a lot of like, why can't I handle this? You know, there is a lot from the public saying, you're superheroes. And we hold first responders as heroes, but they are not superheroes. They still process exposure to trauma like everybody else. And Phil, she says that these changes are going to be costly and it could take some time. Now, some will be covered by that pending CPD consent decree, but other changes that she says are necessary, not covered by that court order. Amanda, thank you. As hundreds of Catholic bishops meet in a Chicago suburb today, the sexual abuse scandal surrounding the church seems to have reached a new stage. 300 Catholic bishops from across the country are meeting at Mundelein Seminary for a week-long spiritual retreat. Activists used the opportunity to call on the Pope to remove Chicago's Archbishop Cardinal Blaise Supich from a committee organizing a Vatican conference on sexual abuse next month. And just last month, the Illinois Attorney General's Office released a report indicating the six Illinois Catholic dioceses failed to disclose sexual abuse allegations of at least 500 priests and clergy members. Joining us to help unpack all the news is Chicago Sun-Times investigative journalist Robert Hergeth, who also covers religion. And we should note that a spokeswoman for the Archdiocese of Chicago said they're unable to send a representative to our show tonight, but we are planning to interview Cardinal Blaise Supich in the coming weeks. Bob, thank you for being here. First of all, let's back up a bit uh, regarding the allegations. Uh, the Attorney General's office uh, released their their results of what they perceived to be the situation in Illinois. Remind us what the uh, what their conclusions were. Sure. There's six dioceses or sort of geographic boundaries um, uh, that uh, consist of sort of local regions of the Catholic Church. And of those six, uh, what the Attorney General found was about 500 more priest allegations than previously were reported. Now, some of these may or may not be credible, but they were allegations and they were not previously known. And uh, Cardinal Blaise Supich's reaction to these uh, findings on the part of the Attorney General? Well, I mean, the Cardinal released a statement. He didn't grant interviews that I know of, um, but the statement was very, um, you know, apologetic toward the victims and the failings of the church, but at the same time sort of pushing back against some of the findings because I, there, was some, there was some vagueness to them in terms of which dioceses were more responsible than others, um, but other people pointed out that he's sort of the top churchman in the state and the church is the church regardless of sort of the boundaries. Um, at stake here. And uh, in light of this gathering of, of 300 Catholic bi bishops in uh, Mundelein, uh, the Archdiocese released a statement to us. It was saying in part, the Archdiocese of Chicago recognizes and mourns the grave damage done to many people harmed by clergy sexual abuse. We will always need to own and express deep regret for the suffering caused both by the abuse and the past failures to respond. And they go on to say in part that uh, since 2002, the Archdiocese has promptly reported every allegation of child sexual abuse to civil authorities. And they say that they assert that uh, they have published the names of clergy with substantiated allegations of abuse since 2006. So uh, tell us what more about what is happening in Mundelein. This is a remarkable gathering, isn't it? Well, yes and no. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a spiritual retreat, and it's unclear exactly all that's going to be done there because it's private just for bishops. And bishops, again, are sort of the leaders of, of the Catholic Church, appointed by the Pope. And they're going to be praying, presumably, on this issue. Um, but a lot of, uh, you know, kind of regular Catholics out there, I think, would rather see um, direct action rather than just prayer. And that's going to be coming, I know, in February, you know, uh, we think, um, when they meet again. Um, but I think the criticism against the bishops has been, again, that th there's not been much action on this is issue, which bubbled up and sort of blew up in August. And here we are in January. And uh, here we are with the, uh, with, with the uh, word being that this gathering is going to focus on prayer and spiritual reflection. And as you mentioned, some folks think it needs to be a little more focused on the issue at hand. And, uh, but there is this conference that you alluded to on uh, sexual abuse planned for next month. And the uh, protesters are calling on the Pope to remove Cardinal Supich from the organizing committee for that event. And uh, what's likely to happen with that uh, request? Oh, I, I don't, I don't know, but I would, I would be surprised if he actually removed it. Um, the, the cardinal in Chicago here is really um, his stature since, he, since uh, over the past few months has really risen um, in terms of the worldwide church, and he's had, um, you know, a lot of um, attention on him or on this issue. And he's, uh, even though he's had controversies himself about this topic in terms of some of the things he's said, 
and some of the things he, can, he will continue to not do in terms of releasing all the names uh, that, that the Archdiocese is aware of, of uh, priests with um, allegations belonging to someone like the religious orders, for instance. So what is expected to happen at this conference? What is the hope? Well, I think well, this conference, again, is a worldwide gathering of bishops as opposed to what's going on in, in Mundelein now is sort of the spiritual of just American bishops. Uh, and the Vatican in February will be worldwide bishops so um, that will get together and uh, presumably tackle this issue of sex abuse uh, once and for all is certainly the hope and not just sex abuse but also in terms of the bishops and their accountability and, um, uh, and how they act in this regard in terms of cover-ups. Um, that have permeated the church for, for decades. Well, and uh, for decades, uh, critics of the church have said that the, uh, that the church has underreported, that it's not been forthcoming. Uh, to what extent has the church been completely forthcoming or at least more forthcoming? Well, Cardinal Supich has said, well, you know, our cards on the table and the credible allegations have been out there, but that wasn't true because just, um, you know, while Lisa Madigan was investigating, they released 10 more names that had been in sort of their books for, um, uh, many years and they had a reason for that well they weren't released because they were they were deceased when the allegations came in or whatever it was but the point was there were credible allegations against these priests and they were not released at the time so is uh, it, so what is the what is the general reaction to how generally speaking the pope the church cardinal supich how they're doing regarding the uh, the sexual abuse scandal well uh, you know there have been there have been um, surveys that have shown that the pope's sort of uh, you know the the population's impression of him has, has gone down throughout this scandal, and certainly there have been um, uh, there's it's been a roller coaster ride for this cardinal in Chicago. Um, he's you know he's been the center of some storm for various things he said that were uh, deemed insensitive about this topic. So I think it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a very critical sort of uh, eye that I think a lot of faithful Catholics have against this uh, the Pope and a lot of the leadership. Bob Herga, thank you so much for joining us. Very much appreciate. Thank it. you. And there's more Chicago tonight just ahead. So please stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by the City Club of Chicago. Smart people may disagree about what makes a great city, but part of what makes Chicago great is that we don't have to agree. To run a city like ours, a lot of issues come up. The City Club of Chicago is a place to debate those issues and hear from the men and women who shape the policies, lead the industries, and tell the stories that define our city for the free and open exchange of ideas. The City Club of Chicago. Still to come on Chicago tonight, free speech protections, how they came about and what is to come. A look at a new nonprofit furnishing homes for the needy. Tracking the week's top political stories in spotlight politics. And fun and funky creations by a group of Chicago artists who blossomed in the 1960s. But first, Eddie Aruza and an out-of-this-world achievement, Eddie. Phil, just about 30 minutes before midnight our time on Monday, a new milestone was reached 4 billion miles from Earth. The New Horizons spacecraft was the first to fly by Pluto three summers ago, and yesterday it flew by an even more distant object by the name of Ultima Thule. The relatively tiny object in the outer solar system is now the farthest cosmic body to be reached by humans, and the data New Horizons sends back could reveal many secrets about how the planets came to be formed. And joining us from the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory in Laurel, Maryland is Alan Stern, the principal investigator of the New Horizons mission, who has been with the project since its inception. Alan Stern, first of all, congratulations to you and your team on this incredible milestone. I'm sure you're feeling both exhilarated and exhausted at this point, aren't you? There's a little bit of both um, on all of the team, but we're, we are, as you say, we are really happy. Well, it takes a while to send that data back from four billion miles away, about six hours or so. And this afternoon, you revealed the clearest images taken so far that you've received. Tell us a little bit about what you've seen. Yeah, well, this um, object that we flew by a billion miles beyond Pluto, uh, it, which is, you know, was born and has always lived out there in this region called the Kuiper Belt near absolute zero because the sun's heating is so weak, um, turns out to be something that's confirmed one of the major theories of planetary formation. Literally overnight, we found that, um, that uh, one theory uh, predicts about exactly what we, we saw in terms of the shape of the object and it, its color distribution, and the other theory didn't. And so I think we've made a very big discovery. Uh, 
One of the things that you have found uh, is it's that it's a binary contact because for a while there, there was some speculation that it might actually be two different objects orbiting each other. And you also have some preliminary color images of Ultima Thule. What, what uh, do these images tell you? Well, the, uh, the, the images of the surface tell us, as you say, that it's a contact binary. There are two lobes. One's about three times larger than the other. In fact, we've named the two after uh, Ultima and Thule. The big one is Ultima, of course. Uh, and they are in contact with each other. They, they seem to have formed nearby and then um, through some gravitational process come together to where they appear stuck together. But we're not sure if that's gravity or if they're actually mechanical forces holding them together. However, both of them uh, have the same red color which is another clue to the fact that they were born in the same place. The, uh, at your press conference this afternoon, you also had a graphic showing some of the key features that you can show so far, that, that there are visible so far. But uh, uh, New Horizons took an awful lot of data in its flyby. So what are you expecting to receive in the coming months and really even years? Sure. Well, let me start by saying that we have far less than 1% of the data on the ground. The really high resolution imagery isn't on the ground. The, the really good compositional information isn't on the ground. A lot of the atmospheric search, a lot of the satellite search and ring search observations uh, and many other types of data like taking its temperature and measuring its radar reflectivity are still in our future. 99.7% of the data is still on the spacecraft waiting to be transmitted back. And you'll be receiving even uh, more clear images in the days and weeks to come, won't you? Yeah, that's absolutely true. Uh, the very closest imagery, which is the most detailed, which will have 25 times the amount of detail of what we were able to show today, um, won't be down until next month in February. Ultima Thule was discovered just three and a half years ago. Tell us a little bit about that because it, it's so tiny, it's only about 21 miles long, and at that distance, 4 billion miles, it's really hard to see anything way out there. And tell us how it was discovered and how it became the next flyby object after Pluto. Sure. Well, we wanted to fly by an ancient Kuiper Belt object after Pluto, uh, and we ultimately, that's no pun, ultimately uh, pressed the Hubble Space Telescope into service as uh, the most sensitive machine to try and find something like this. Remember, Ultima's not even as big as Greater Chicago, uh, and its reflectivity is very low, like, um, like garden soil. And it's four billion miles from the sun, so it's extremely faintly lit. And then it's gotta reflect all that light back uh, four billion miles to the Earth. And the end product makes it a million times, not quite, but almost a million times fainter than Pluto, which itself is 10,000 two, times two dim to see with your naked eye. So this was quite a heavy lift in terms of the technology. Uh, but we used the Hubble and we spotted Ultima, Thule, as well as several other um, potential candidates. And we picked this one out um, for our target. Getting there in itself after Pluto was quite an achievement and a challenge because you didn't know what it might encounter, including space dust. Even the smallest particles could have derailed the project and, and aligning it to make sure that it flew by at the distance it did, about 2,200 miles from its surface, was in itself an accomplishment. Can you tell us a little bit about the challenges of getting it there? This is a tough, tough assignment, as you said. Um, we didn't understand the hazard environment. The navigational challenges were severe. Um, uh, the lighting levels are lower than at Pluto. The communications times are longer. Every single aspect of doing the Ultima extended mission um, has been more technically challenging on the spacecraft than doing Pluto. And Pluto itself, you know, was the farthest exploration that had ever been done. We now shattered that record. And it all turned out great. We have a, uh, just an amazing spacecraft and an amazing team of flight controllers, scientists and engineers who put this plan in place and uh, you know, operating by remote control, four billion miles from home, New Horizons killed it. And New Horizons still has a lot of life left in it. It's going to be traveling and it'll probably be one of the spacecrafts in the not too distant future that actually leaves the solar system. But you are trying to find yet another object out there in the very cluttered Kuiper belt to explore. Anything on the, pardon the pun, horizon? <laughs> um, I owe you one. Thanks. Um, <laughs> You know, um, we haven't started looking yet. Uh, I, want my, I want my team to pay attention to getting this right before we 
you know, go after the next shiny thing, if you will. Uh, so we actually won't search for a new target for a year or possibly two. We have to first get all this data back, and then we have to write a proposal to NASA to carry the mission on for a longer period of time. And if that's approved, then we'll go about the search. So check back in. So what kinds of things will you be looking at as you get data over the next uh, weeks and months and years in, in terms of finding out or uh, revealing some mysteries of how the solar system came to be? Yeah, we want to find out in detail how Ultima was assembled and what it was assembled out of. So the geological and structural information that we can get from the cameras, compositional information that we can get from our spectrometers, and we want to find out if it's surrounded by satellites and debris left over from its formation, or if it has an atmosphere, which we don't expect, but would be a surprising and important find if we made it. Uh, you and your, your co-author of the book, uh, uh, David Grinspoon, were here in our studios last May, and uh, the, the, the book was called Chasing New Horizons, and it was about the, the long and arduous process of getting the spacecraft off the ground and into space. But do you think it needs a sequel at this point? <laughs> well, you know, if, uh, if, if, if I understand my editors right, it probably does. <laughs> well, uh, Alan Stern, thank you so much, and congratulations again on this achievement, and we look forward to a lot of uh, revelations and discoveries coming up uh, in, the, in the future. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, uh, your coverage. Alan Stern is co-author of Chasing New Horizons, which was released last year, and as I mentioned, might need a sequel sometime soon. On our website, you can watch our conversation with Dr. Stern and his co-author. And we're back with more right after this. Coverage of science and technology on Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Joel M. Friedman, president of the Alvin H. Baum Family Fund. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. That's part of the First Amendment drafted in 1789. But the U.S. Supreme Court didn't interpret those words until the early 20th century. Now, 100 years later, where do freedom of speech protections stand and what lies ahead? A new book called The Free Speech Century takes a deep dive into those questions and more. And joining us to discuss the book is one of its co-editors, Jeffrey Stone, the Edward H. Levy Distinguished Service Professor of Law at the University of Chicago. Law School. Welcome back to Chicago tonight, Jeff. Good to see you. Thanks, Phil. Delighted to be here. First of all, as I mentioned, the First Amendment drafted in 1789, but it wasn't until 1919 that there were a cluster of cases that uh, first interpreted it. What was the upshot of those cases? Well, the cases involved free speech in wartime. Uh, it was during World War I, and uh, Congress passed legislation that was encouraged by the Wilson administration that effectively made it a crime for any person to criticize the war of the draft. And the cases came to the Supreme Court of the United States, and a series of defendants maintained that those laws violated the First Amendment. And in the decisions in the spring of 1919, uh, the court unanimously upheld the convictions and basically took the view that if an individual criticizes government policy in a way that one should reasonably understand that it might lead people, if they oppose the government policy, to violate the law, then they can be punished for causing those people to violate the law. So if you criticize the draft and you say that it's immoral, and that turns some people against the draft, and they may refuse induction, then you could be criminally punished for doing that, even if that was not your intent, and even if you didn't say anything about refusing induction. That's, uh, that's quite remarkable, because it's inconceivable for, the, for, uh, for a court to take that position today. Uh, and we'll talk about its evolution in just a minute. But uh, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes referred to the First Amendment as an experiment at what point. What did he mean? Well, this was in this, the fall of 1919, several months later. He had been the justice who wrote those opinions. Uh, there were unanimous decisions. And over the summer of 1919, Holmes was criticized by a number of other people. And he gave some reflection to what this was all about. And when he came back in the, in the, in the fall of the following uh, Supreme Court term, um, he wrote dissenting opinions, uh, joined by Justice uh, Louis Brandeis, um, in which he basically said that uh, individuals cannot be punished for criticizing the government or for government policy unless their speech creates a clear and present danger of grave harm. And in the course of those opinions, he talked about the fact that that, that like so much else that we do in a democracy, is an experiment. And what he recognized was that speech can cause harm. It can cause people to do bad things. But he said, we have to take that risk 
because what we're basically doing in a democracy is saying that people need to be able to hear all positions on all issues so they can make their own judgments about what's the right position that they should support. And if you're told they can't hear those positions, then uh, we are running the risk of, of preventing uh, individuals from making those decisions for themselves and advocating for them and changing government policy. And he, recognizing those risks there, he said, that's the experiment. It's a critical experiment of democracy because we don't know that people will come to the right conclusions. We don't know that when they hear all different positions, they will actually reach the right results. But we're willing to trust them to try to do that, and that's the critical experiment that's at the heart of a democracy. And that's been the trajectory of cases since increased protections for, uh, for speech. But uh, you, uh, the book also discussed some critiques or controversies surrounding the First Amendment, and one of those is Citizens United versus FEC strikes you as a particularly important one and wrong-headed. Expand. Yes, well, one of the most important Supreme Court decisions in our history, and the one which today I would say um, has been most harmful to the nation, um, is the Citizens United decision, which was a 5-4 decision. And um, the reason I think it was misguided is that the primary reason underlying the decision, in the court's opinion, was distrust of legislators who pass laws that restrict the electoral or the speech process because the danger is that they will manipulate the process and adopt laws that will benefit them. And therefore, we should be extremely distrustful when they do that. And when they regulate campaign finance, they are doing things which they may know will benefit them and disadvantage their opponents, and therefore, we should be very skeptical about it. And that's a fair concern. Uh, but on the other hand, the problem with this is that we know it has had a devastating effect on our democracy. That basically, uh, the law before that, which had been adopted as a joint piece of legislation by Republicans and Democrats, signed into law by President Bush, um, basically limited the amount that corporations and individuals could contribute or spend uh, in support of political candidates. And the idea was that we don't want the electoral process to be dominated by a relatively small group of billionaires um, who can have an enormous uh, effect on, on our democracy. And What's the likelihood of that case being overturned or curtailed? Not at all in the near future. I think the current makeup of the Supreme Court, um, with the additions of Neil Gorsuch to replace Justice Scalia, who was one of the justices in the majority, and um, with Justice Kavanaugh to replace uh, Justice Kennedy, who was in the majority, there's no real possibility of it changing anytime soon. But the effect it's had on a democracy is very serious. It affects um, our elected representatives who spend an enormous amount of their time raising money and cultivating the people who can provide them with huge um, uh, contributions. So, well, excuse me. Yeah, go but, on. Sure, sure. One of the things the book points out, and uh, it, 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 it rings very true, is that freedom of speech is not just a legal concept at this point, but it's part of the American identity. Expand on that. Yeah, well, it's interesting that um, th the notion of free speech is something that's become central to how we think of our democracy and how we think of our nation. And internationally, for example, um, other nations have, have looked at what we've done and almost uh, entirely followed our example. Uh, nations that didn't have a history, a tradition of free speech, um, have learned from how we've developed a tradition of free speech and acted upon it. The two areas where modern democracies around the world depart from American doctrine are first on campaign finance, where most other Western democracies have regulations of money in, in the pol political system that we have held to be unconstitutional. And the other is hate speech, where most other Western democracies have restrictions on what is called hate speech that the Supreme Court of the United States has held to be unconstitutional. And there the issue is basically the notion that, from our perspective, the view is that we do not trust the majority to make rules restricting what ideas can be advocated. One of the things we've learned is it's an experiment, and the experiment means that everything is on the table, and that anything a person wants to advocate for um, cannot be prohibited. It can be responded to, it can be answered, it can be argued about, but it can't be prohibited. People used to be, used to believe that Earth was the center of the universe. Um, they used to believe that women's place was in the home. They used to believe that African Americans were uh, inferior. They used to believe that gays were, were horrible people. Um, those things were challenged in America, and people were able to argue about them. And, and over time, we came to different positions. And if government had the authority to silence those views, we would not have been who we are today. Other countries have 
generally accepted that proposition, but when it comes to hate speech, they've said, no, 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 that's off the table. How about, uh, you also talk about, you also write, you and, you and the, uh, the contributors discuss uh, problems or challenges to free speech on the Internet. Uh, in a nutshell, what are your concerns? What well, are the concerns? One of the great challenges about the, the f free speech in the future um, is that it used to be the case when 25 years ago or so, or 50 years ago, that most people got their news and information from reasonably mainstream and reliable sources, um, whether it was PBS or NBC or CBS or the New York Times or Washington Post or Chicago Sun Times. Um, basically, the information in the news they got was reasonably reliable, and they acted upon that. They disagreed about how to think about what they knew, but what they knew was basically reliable. Now, with cable news and with the Internet, we've reached a point where large portions of our population are coming to believe things that are factually inaccurate. And the ability to respond to that in what Holmes talked about is the marketplace of ideas. Um, has become much less effective because people tend to go to their own websites, they look at what's on their websites, they believe what's on those websites, and they take those views. Um, and that's become a real challenge to democracy. Uh, and that's one part of the Internet that is really problematic. The other part of it is that um, individuals and groups are able to intimidate people who take certain positions on the Internet and to threaten them. And one of the things the Supreme Court's figured out about free speech is that individuals are often easily chilled in their willingness to take controversial positions. Because I know if I sign a petition or if I go to a, a demonstration, it's not going to change the world. And if I fear that if I do that, I am going to be in trouble with my employers or with other people, I'll say the hell with it. I won't bother doing it. And if, if I as an individual don't do it, it doesn't matter. But if a lot of people like me don't do it, taking my position don't do it, then the marketplace of ideas is distorted. And one of the things people have become worried about on the internet is that there are these trolls who will attack mm. people and who will try to intimidate them and will basically um, f frighten them into no longer taking their positions. And that's a phenomenon th that has now taken on a much greater role in social media, and it's something I think we have to think about as a society of how we deal with. Jeffrey Stone, thank you so much for joining us. Very much appreciated. Always a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And you can read an excerpt from the Free Speech Century on our website. The refrain this time of year is out with the old, in with the new. And for those replacing furniture, some of it may be among the old that's on its way out. But if that outdated sofa still has some life left in it, a Chicago nonprofit wants to put it to use instead of in a landfill. Brandis Friedman has a story at the Chicago Furniture Bank where furniture and people in need get a second chance. A kitchen table is a simple piece of furniture. Put a family around it and it becomes much more. My child sits here every day as I'm preparing dinner. She sits right here and I'm like, you gotta do your letters, you gotta do your numbers. A few months ago, having a table where her children could practice their writing, let alone sleep in their own beds, seemed impossible for Maritza Madero. Domestic violence had left her family homeless. Worse yet, Madero knew that even if she was able to find an affordable apartment, she had nothing to put in it. All I had was literally the suitcases that we were carrying. So as I'm looking for apartments, that's all I kept thinking, like, what are we going to sleep on? Air mattresses? Like, what are we going to have? That's when her social worker told her about the Chicago Furniture Bank. She was like, I got somewhere where we can go to get you furniture for your house. You would just have to pay $50, you know, and they'll fill up your whole apartment with furniture. I was like, are you serious? Chicago Furniture Bank co-founder Griffin Amdor says the idea for the enterprise came from a conversation with his father about antique furniture. We were sort of talking about how this stuff used to have a lot of value back in the day, and now it's basically worthless. Amdur, then a senior at the University of Pennsylvania, began thinking there must be a way to bring that unwanted furniture to the people who needed it most. Penn had this prize, the Penn President's Engagement Prize, which gives three senior nonprofit projects seed funding, and thought this was a good idea, you know, do a lot of good and help a lot of people. So Amdur and fellow Penn students Andrew Witherspoon and James McPhail developed a proposal for a furniture bank where people in need could get an entire apartment's worth of furniture for $50. They won the prize and with the award money started operating out of a West Side warehouse in August. 
Not long after, the trio furnished their first client's home. And in the early days, they did all the heavy lifting themselves. It's all about the form. It's all, it's all, it's all with the knees. <laughs> Just a few months later, the bank has furnished more than 230 homes for the needy. The organization partners with social service agencies who bring clients to hand-pick furniture from a 6,000-square-foot showroom. We ensure that every single person in the home can get a bed. We also offer couches, armchairs, dressers, kitchen tables, kitchenware items, pots and pans, utensils, dishes, you name it. Uh, it takes a lot to furnish an entire apartment, um, and we want to be the one-stop shop for our clients. We are giving people you know, a dignified choice in their furniture and anything that we wouldn't take, we are not, certainly not going to give to them. With donations of furniture and cash, as well as efforts from volunteers, they have already been able to ramp up capacity and hire additional workers. We come from a school where most all of our friends are working uh, pretty intense corporate jobs and we're out here in a warehouse in Chicago moving furniture for, for people in need and so I wouldn't trade it for the world. As Maritza Madero starts down her own new path, she's grateful for their efforts. She recalls the day she surprised her children with a newly furnished apartment, including their own beds. She was like, this is my bed. I was like, yeah, she was like, forever, like no one's gonna take it. I was like, no one is ever gonna take this bed from you. The furniture bank to me really was like a miracle and a blessing for me for $50. I got everything that I could ever think of and I'm very thankful for it. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And you can find a link to the Chicago Furniture Bank's website and information on how you can donate or volunteer on our website. The field of candidates for Chicago mayor is narrowing a bit as Chicago election officials scramble to get the ballot ready in time. Meanwhile, an outgoing Chicago alderman is in custody tonight facing domestic abuse charges, as you heard at the top of the show. Our political reporters, Paris Schutz and Amanda Vinicky, have those stories and more on this week's Spotlight Politics. Paris and Amanda, thank you for being here. Not that you had any choice. <laughs> <laughs> we work here. We want to be here, but still. First of all, the latest on Ricardo Munoz and what he's facing. Uh, it's in a, in a way, it's in terms of his political career, he'd already announced that right. uh, he was not stepping down. Uh, the, the real world impact of that, besides obviously the, the uh, you know, the, what, what his wife has gone through. Well, here's what we know. Allegedly. Right, yeah. What we know right now is he is in custody in North Lawndale Police Station. He is facing misdemeanor uh, domestic abuse charges. He's going to appear in domestic court tomorrow. As you mentioned, he is leaving once his term is over. He's served in city council for 25 years. He's been open in the past about struggles with alcoholism and uh, affiliations with gangs when he was a little kid. Um, not saying that this is connected to anything like that. It's an unfortunate situation for he and his wife and his family. Most certainly, if he wasn't stepping down, he would probably, pending these charges sticking around, he would probably face calls to leave office. And I do believe that the Chicago Tribune, I just saw, has also reported that his wife filing for an order of protection mm -hmm. and say, asking him to stay away from their home, from their dog, and that she's filing for, I believe, $1,000 a month in support. So it is a, one of those things where, of course, he's a public figure. We need to report on this. Um, the consequences of it are much for the family. This doesn't appear to have any connection to his work as an alderman, but well, it's certainly well, something that we'll be following. would affect uh, his future should he decide to well, get he back into the a run for mayor, mm -hmm. for example, right. ended up not taking that leap, but most certainly it could affect that. Well, let's talk about early voting. When does it begin and what's uh, what's the progress made in terms of uh, coming <laughs> coming over the final Slowly version? But surely that ballot <laughs> is is getting finished. Uh, the, the state law says it has to begin 40 days prior to the election. So that would be January 17th. The Chicago Board of Elections says ain't gonna happen. That the ballot will not be ready. All of these legal challenges won't be sorted out till then. And so at January 17th, it would be at the super site in the loop on Washington Avenue. So saying if you show up January 17th, you can get a request for a mail order ballot. They'll mail you the ballot, uh, but there won't be a final ballot ready by then. Then early voting in the wards begins February 11th. The Board of Elections says the ballot will be ready by then we will know who is on the ballot in these races. I will say as somebody who, at least in the last general election statewide, I tried to early vote and it was, of course, the week before. And that is where the elections board says it gets most busy. Very few people cast their ballots really 40 days in advance. And frankly, there are so many mayoral debates and forums. We're still learning a lot about these candidates. So in a sense, it is quite early. And if you speak with elections officials, they say, 
they believe it was really a mistake by state lawmakers that the law changed, that it was you know more than a month out from an election in the first place, but it just that it's difficult that lawmakers haven't gone back and changed the law because it could be perceived as looking like taking back voting rights. And so that's, you know, again, there's this, of course, a political wrestling job at all points in time, but it's not the first time that Chicago or in general other elections authorities have come up into trouble with not complying with state law because they can't because there are still questions as to who should actually be on the ballot. Uh, one of the uh, one of the top tier, I think it's fair to say, candidates, uh, but not necessarily a, the leading candidate uh, for uh, Chicago mayor, recently decided to invest quite a bit of money in some ads. Tell us what that is. Well, that's Gary Chico. He's spending about a million dollars in ads, two ads, one that's going to introduce himself because this is all about name recognition right now, Phil. No one's polling really high. Gary Chico, if we're to believe these polls, which we shouldn't put too much stock in, he's not polling high at all. He's, he's pretty low in the pack, so he needs to introduce himself. And another ad is going to be sort of going on the offensive against Tony Preckwinkle. Chico, of course, the former school board president, CPS president, and, uh, and he's spending a million dollars. He's raised about $1.3 million, so that's going to really eat into the money. He's going to have to keep raising money, as are all of these candidates, because... Bill Daly, he's got about $3 million. He's, and he's on the a front runner in terms of fundraising. In terms of fundraising. In terms of fundraising. So everyone is going gonna, is, is gonna to be on the air, and it's going to be really expensive. And then, you know, if there's a runoff, which there definitely will be, then you're going to have to fund this stuff through April. Well, and what I think is really interesting is, as you noted, one is an introductory ad. The other is beginning to tear down one of those perceived front runners in Preckwinkle. And we'll wait and see how many other candidates take that strategy. How much money do they put into building up their own neck name recognition versus tearing down one of the perceived front runners. And this has long been seen as what is going to be trouble for Preckwinkle, particularly that soda tax. You know, she may have sailed to re-election as Cook County board president, but if ads stir that can, shake the can, <laughs> that just came to me, hey. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you, that could explode her chances, sure. Well, uh, Chewy Garcia is weighing in on a very, in a very prominent aldermanic race. Uh, tell us what he's done. Well, this is a race, of course, this is uh, against Alderman Ed Burke, who, as we have covered, is facing his own legal troubles. We still don't know what exactly he is under investigation for, but one of the ways in which he had seen as maybe having a window to victory is because he had so many challengers. Now, however, the man who is seen as kind of the progressive boss, Congressman to be, as of tomorrow, actually, Chewy Garcia. Garcia, choosing a person in this field. It's interesting because he had two of the other individuals had actually worked for him or his campaign, but instead he has chosen the woman to be the Ta first. Yeah, Tanya Patino. What, what Garcia's done here is really interesting. So three of the challengers to Ed Burke were connected to Chewy Garcia. He kind of put them out there and said, who's going to be the strongest? Who's going to raise the most money? Who is the one I can rely on? And he went with Tanya Patino. The others are Jaime Guzman and Ho Jose Luis Torres. Patino had a petition challenge. She says that she has passed all that. Obviously, we, we expect that would probably be true if Garcia is, is, is going to go out there and put his support behind her. She's 28 years old. She's a lifelong resident of the ward. She is a civil engineer. She works as a soccer coach, youth, youth, youth soccer coach. Uh, so she, she, she has all the credentials that make her kind of the anti-Ed Burke in some of the progressive circles minds. And certainly it's believed that in this race and in that district, the nod from Garcia carries a lot of weight. As of now, though, if you'll still have those additional people. As we noted, ballot isn't sorted out, so well, they could still we'll drop out, but it's going to be a yeah, we'll see if they drop right out. Well, let's fast forward uh, to the year 2020 because uh, it <laughs> seems that Senator Dick Durbin may already have a potential challenger. Uh, who can who wants to take that on? Well, I mean, he hasn't actually even declared for sure yet that he's running. Though, as we've talked about previously, he's indicated he's that he's shape. thinking about it. He's doing doing some but, uh, yeah, 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 doing ways. some walking yeah. and running and weightlifting and right. phone calling to raise <laughs> money. Um, but the individual who actually announced on her Facebook page yesterday is the soon-to-be state representative that will be taking over a formerly Republican-held seat, and that is Ann Stava Murray. She is the one 
one who has talked about trying to really uh, file some discrimination and claims she, and she such. She was on our show recently. She was. Um, and so this is her. She came on to talk about her vote against Illinois House Speaker Michael Madigan. And she says that's part of why, even before she has taken her seat in the Illinois House, she wants to move on to Washington, D.C. because she wrote on her Facebook page that it, it, she believes there is a better culture for women and less sexual harassment and other forms of harassment there than there is Springfield. But Perry, she's, she's getting some pushback on this announcement. Well, she hasn't even entered her first job in the public sphere yet. She's a couple weeks away from being inaugurated into this race she won. So it seems a bit unprecedented to declare for another race before you even started your first job in politics. Although Susanna Mendoza, Tony Preckwinkle, we know they were running for, for basically two offices at the same time, but they have been in public life for a long time. So it, it, it's, it's a little bit of an odd announcement. We'll, we'll see how the field really shakes out over the next couple of years. Paris, Amanda, thank you both very much. And back with more right after this. This evening's presentation of Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by ComEd. ComEd presents the power of a switch. CFL bulbs use up to 75% less energy and can last up to 10 times longer than incandescents. ComEd, powering lives. Our show at the Art Institute explores the work of Chicago artists who made a big splash in the 1960s. Called the Harry Who, they were an early wave of what later became known as the Chicago Imagists. The Harry Who were skillful technicians who used popular imagery with a playful approach. More than 50 years after they emerged, they recently received their first major museum exhibition. We recently brought you this story, and here is another look. Two floors of the museum have been invaded by the Harry Who. Their name was a play on words when one of the artists misheard the name of the WFMT art critic at the time, Harry Boris. Beginning in 1966, the Harry Who were featured in a series of shows at the Hyde Park Art Center and around the country. The Harry Who were six artists who came together, they named themselves, they organized themselves. Um, they were all recent graduates of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago when they started showing the Hyde Park Art Center in the South Side. And I think there was a cheekiness and sort of an idea that they were going to create their own context for their work. Their art training was non-traditional. I think their art history professors favored other avenues of investigation, taking them and encouraging them to go to the Field Museum, to the um, uh, other institutions in the city that had artwork from other cultures, not from a primitive point of view, but from a point of view of these are artists, their work is just as valuable as what we're doing. They made a plan to present themselves as a loose collective of highly individual artists. There was a lot of play and a lot of fun and a lot of joy and laughter in these planning meetings, and then they kind of got serious and went back to their studios as individuals, made their work. One of the things that I think about their work is that it was sophisticated, sophomoric type quality about it. There's a lot of puerile sexuality, I think, in it. The common factor, I think, was that it was a lot of it was vernacular. Um, they were interested in American culture and other cultures, but particularly those things that you could find every day. So children's coloring books, they were especially interested in movies, um, pop music, or rock and roll booze. We all at the time had uh, and have an interest in popular culture. But I think what, what is so uh, unique about the Harry Who and the Chicago Images um, interest in popular culture is there were lots of other influences as well from art history. Uh, it could be Mesoamerican art, it could be Aztec art, it could be outsider art. The six Harry Who artists are Carl Worsom, Gladys Nilsson, Jim Falconer, Art Green, Jim Nutt, and Sue Ellen Roca. They are still with us, and we caught up with Sue Ellen Roca at the Elmhurst Art Museum, where she curated a new show of Imagist art from the Elmhurst College Art Collection. We asked her about beginning an art career in the 1960s. The 60s were a reaction to the 50s, where there was so much conformity. The 60s was a wonderful time to be that age 
and to have a, a youth revolution. Back at the Art Institute, it's a kind of homecoming for the artists who literally went to school in the building. At the time when they were students, the school was housed within the museum. So to get to class, they were walking through these hallways every day. We did walk through the galleries to get to school, and that was one of the things that I think all of us have cited that was so important about that experience is that we were constantly in touch with works in the collection. Because literally we walked through the building to get to, to our classes. The story hadn't been told, there had never been a, an exhibition focused exclusively on them, and it was time to do it. It's wonderful that it's happened. At the time when we had the shows, I don't think we were ever expecting that it would be shown at the Art Institute. The Harry Who Show at the Art Institute of Chicago runs through this Sunday, January 6th. And the work of the Chicago Images can be seen at the Elmhurst Art Museum through January 13th. There's more to see on our website. And that is our show for this Wednesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. After a month in office, we check in with Cook County Assessor Fritz Kage and his goals for the year ahead. And Jay Shefsky will be here with a preview of the upcoming season of Jay's Chicago. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Phil Ponce and I thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, dedicated to preserving the dignity and rights of all individuals.